All righty, Old Roller Nation, welcome to the show. Second degree black belt, uh, the second black belt, uh, the American black belt that Andre Govau gave, and the first uh, Autos affiliate, uh, Tim Sled. Tim, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. This is uh, really, really exciting. So uh, I actually uh, uh, was not familiar with you uh, previous to Gary Hull, uh, who we had on the show, and he said a few uh, really awesome things about you that really made me interested in uh, learning from you. And uh, just tonight, I bought your uh, leg drag uh, instructional on uh, Dijitsu uh, because I love the leg drag. And when I was watching just the little primer for it, you the, you kind of broke down a couple of things, and you had a thing there that you you called uh, the uh, the Andre Golval uh, leg drag. And it turns out that that's the way I've always just been doing it. I never learned it from him, obviously, but uh, came to maybe similar conclusions about how to keep you know nimble guard players uh, from being nimble. Uh, but uh, that little just the little uh, bits and pieces of what you showed, I, I I realized that there are some elements to the leg drag that it being one of my favorite passes, I'm still not familiar with. So there's, there's room to grow there. And uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to learn from you on that. So right out of the gate, uh, excited to talk to you and maybe, maybe get some insights on that before we get started on that too. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, that's, that's uh, that DVD has got some date on it now, but um, the concepts are still concepts that I use all the time in training. Man, your dogs are jerks trying to cut in on my interview. They really are. Uh, these guys, they, Come on. And the big one, oh man, the gas that this thing can create. Right. Oh, yeah, it's wait worse. till I get talking. You're gonna there's gonna be a lot of hot air. But do you um, do you know what a Vidalia onion is? Like if you're yeah. with them. Okay, so Vidalia onions when they start to go bad, smell worse than anything on the planet. I thought until we got this guy, and he he just he he embarrasses Vidalia onions. They're just like we give up. We we <laughs> surrender. You win. Nice. Nice. No, the, uh, Sorry about that. No, you're good. The, the uh, leg drag DVD uh, at the time when I was putting it together, when I was teaching that seminar, I really wanted it to be sort of a master class on the basics, the principles of the leg drag position, mm -hmm. not just the past, the position. And at that time, you know, there were very few people out there teaching it and exploring it. And, you know, and so it was, it was a, this, it basically is a primer. Um, it's, it's a, I would say a foundation from which you can launch into a lot of different stuff now. I mean, mm -hmm. there's eight years on that, on that DVD, I think that, uh, and, and it's, that position has been explored and there, you know, there's, the the barambolo from it the truck mm -hmm. positions from it all of these things that i don't even explore in the dvd which are now almost commonplace people are going to say oh i wonder why you know tim didn't go into that in 2012 that nut hadn't been cracked but the position is there and the the fundamentals of that position that are explored are still solid i still I, I still get message after message after message of people who pick it up and they're just like hey that's exactly what i needed to make that work um and that's really exciting yeah because uh, i i've had good success with the leg drag um so to give you a little bit of background on me i've been doing jujitsu for five years uh i got my purple belt right before uh we had to shut down uh for covid uh which was a real bummer uh, because um, I was starting to feel like I was hitting this hockey stick of growth and understanding, you know, like that curve. Oh, yeah. And right as I started that upward, you know, uh, upward swing, that's when we had to shut down. And yeah. so I've been trying to um, do everything that I could to um, maintain that in any way that I could. So yeah. this podcast actually was created as a part of that uh, because – my 40th birthday was in June. Happy birthday. And thank you, sir. Uh, and I'm really, I feel younger in a way at 40 than I did at 30 uh, because I have more, I'm, I'm exploring more now. Uh, my mind is, is much more active. Here, get out of here, guys. Let's go out. Sorry, I'm telling the dogs to leave. They're all around my feet. You're good. 
Um, but as, as I look at my start, you know, obviously I started jujitsu at 35. I may have already, you know, reached my athletic peak in terms of what my athletic ceiling is. And so now I have to explore a technical ceiling uh, and to find ways to develop the maximum amount of skill in the minimum amount of time and then maintain that skill for the longest amount of time. Mm. So when the podcast started, the joke was that I wanted to roll dangerously into my 65th birthday. Well, we had the good fortune to interview a gentleman named Tom Corey who started jujitsu at 65 and is a vicious 72 year old Brown belt Mm -hmm. who just completely changed my standards of what, you know, Mm -hmm. what, what longevity is. Yeah. I I, I watched that podcast. Oh man. Is that not like, yeah, I, I reference it in almost every show. It's just because he completely changed my view of what, what, you know, being a tough old dude is. I, I have to up my standards at 40 to meet. I mean, the guy's resting heartbeat at 72 years old is 37 beats a minute. I mean, I, I personally am embarrassed. You know, like I, I really, I got to tighten my game up a lot, you know, because of this guy. Uh, so if nothing else, the old rollers podcast has in a way served a great purpose to me in that it has uh, changed my paradigm of what it means to, to, to have longevity and to be, uh, you know, a tough old roller, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, getting back to you, sorry, I'm not trying to derail this and turn it into the Tom Corey interview. Uh, but uh, when I, when I had interviewed Gary, he said the person that had a big impact on the way he trained uh, and the way he, how seriously he took uh, note taking and, um, uh, putting things together into a usable whole uh, uh, were you and, and Rafael Lovato Jr. Mm-hmm. And he said that you came to a seminar, he, he came to a seminar of yours, and you had an outline and scratch paper for all the participants. Mm-hmm. And he said no one had ever done anything like that before. Mm-hmm. And he said it just set the tone right out of the gate that this is, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're not here to putz around. You know, like this is serious stuff. And, uh, you know, I personally thought that was really exciting. And uh, so I talked to Gary afterward and, you know, we talked about this and I wanted to explore that with you a little bit. What prompted that? uh, And is that something that someone had handed off to you or was that something that you came up with? And what have you seen in terms of the seminars that you've taught, the benefits of that, that mentality, but also just the simple physical act of having an outline and scratch paper. Yeah, so I say this at the at the front end of every seminar because every seminar I do, I take an outline of what I'm going to cover. And it's usually a bare bones outline. That way I don't have to, you know, the younger when I was a younger instructor, it was far more detailed. But then I would get either sidetracked or I would add something to it or I didn't get to where I wanted to get. And so But what I say at the beginning of all of my seminars is, you know, whatever the price is for my seminar, you know, whether somebody's paying $60 for the seminar or $100, I think that's probably the most anybody's ever paid for one of my seminars, as low as 25 bucks. I say, you could pay that money for what you get today. And if you don't retain anything, maybe this was fun and worth that to you. You know, it's kind of like going to Las Vegas. You go to Las Vegas, you... You take 200 bucks with you, 500 bucks with you, whatever, and you know you're not going to come home with anything because the the city wins. It could be fun for you. I'm not, I can't, I'm not a gambler. So what I say is I give you this sheet. And if you, if immediately after the seminar today, you write down in your own words what we covered and what these things on this sheet mean, then your brain's going to engage on another level you're going to have something to go back to. And if you remember 10% more tomorrow than you would have if you hadn't taken notes, you've extended that 25 bucks another day. Mm-hmm. And then if you find that note, and I have, I have books and books from like the late 90s 
they have my notes stuck in them because jujitsu guys in the Midwest who wanted to learn jujitsu had to read books. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you had to get Euler's book. You had to get Jean Jacques' book. You had to get um, Salo's Jiu-Jitsu University right around 2000 when that came out. Um, and so you're, I was taking notes inside of those and I would go take a private lesson from my coach and I would write notes down and I would, so I just tell people that, you know, if nothing else, it makes for some good toilet reading later. Okay. So <laughs> that, everybody who watches this, that's been one of my seminars has heard me say exactly those words because I really want to extend the value. People mm -hmm. don't come to one of my seminars because they've seen me on a podium you know, because they've uh, watched me wreck a black belt in a, in a super fight on fight to win or something like that. People who come to my seminars are often coming because their coach or their professor likes me on, for some reason and, and finds the information that I'm able to disseminate valuable. Mm -hmm. And so I want the people who come to get a really good value out of the time that they're going to spend with me because they're investing time and money for on me and I can just come in there and kind of roll around and, you know, I give them a tough roll and, you know, show the details of Americana and then show details of a figure four toe hold and then show the details of a guillotine and it not have any sort of nexus or tie together. And they're going to forget those moves maybe, or they're going to forget me and, ultimately it, it, it just doesn't benefit them. So the outline concept came up. Um, I'm an attorney and uh, in law school, you roadmap everything. If you're going to make an mm -hmm. oral argument to a court of appeals, you roadmap, you, you learn how to organize your information in such a way that you can track. Um, and, you know, and so I think that discipline carried over for like when I, uh, when I, after law school, I went to graduate school to get my PhD and um, I, I taught statistics classes and I taught criminology classes uh, before I was, I'm, I'm still not a PhD. I ultimately didn't get it, but I, I was all but dissertation toward it. Um, but I had this great opportunity to learn how to teach. Uh, mm -hmm. In law school, we don't teach you how to teach. At the exact same time, while I was in Indiana University, I had the opportunity to teach the jiu-jitsu club there. Boo. <laughs> I'm you, kidding. I'm kidding. Who you root it, for? Oh, no. I, I live in Lexington, Kentucky. It's, oh. it's, uh, uh, but I, I actually have no hate toward uh, Indiana University. A lot of my uh, – uh, actually, one of my very best friends uh, graduated from there. So uh, I, it's lighthearted that I would, I would pick on you a little bit. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and here's the thing. You and I are close, so we're going to have to train. I mean, Lexington's not far. It, it, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I'd love to tussle with you. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, that's, that's definitely on the agenda. Uh, and oh, it, the, one of the things that I like about what you said, and, and it, takes me back to one of the interviews that we did with a guy named uh, Rob Bernanke, uh, who, um, again, doesn't have uh, a huge uh, competitive, you know, list of accolades. Like he's not a world champion, not a multiple world champion, uh, but has been one of the people that, that really affected my uh, ability to uh, learn. Uh, and so – a little bit more background on me. Um, my job requires that I travel. So I don't get to be with my instructor five days a week. Uh, I would love to, but I don't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how old you are. If you've been through law school, you got a couple of years on you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm 42. I'll be 43 in September. Okay. So I'm, I'm 40, obviously. And um, uh, I'm a father of three. And when you become a dad, I used to have like hobby after hobby after hobby. Once you have kids, you get one and that one, you better pour your heart and your soul into because it's the only one that you're getting. So, um, I felt if, you know, if grappling jujitsu was going to be, you know, my, my one thing that I wanted to find a way to, to give it an hour a day. Uh, because I read a book uh, a long time ago and, uh, one of the observations was that, if you studied any subject for an hour a day for a year, you would know as much 
as the top 20% of people in that given field Mm -hmm. to go from the top 20% into the top 10% is much more work. It's like, now it's like an hour a day for five more years, but Mm -hmm. that one year, an hour a day is a big primer. So I've just always used an hour a day as my metric of if if I want to get good at anything, I've got to study it at least an hour a day outside of anything else that I do. And so, um, one of the, the ideas of, of, you know, of Rob's work is, you know, a conceptual framework to understand movement, not necessarily like a set of moves. And that really resonated with me because I'm not, uh, I, let's just say, uh, extraordinarily coordinated, <laughs> but I, I can think analytically in practice. And so, um, uh, that's, that's another element of when you, when we were talking to Gary about the outlines and things, that falls under a similar uh, ideology, which is that information that's packaged in a digestible way is much more useful than information that may be extraordinarily high level, mm-hmm. but is disjointed and you know unrelated uh, to anything else. Um, go ahead, sorry. No, I think one of the things that I've I've taken on as one of, part of my mission in jujitsu is to take away some of the mystique, you know, jujitsu is mechanics, not magic. Um, I came up in an era, so I started Brazilian jujitsu in 1998. And the, it was magic. You know, you, you were learning, you were learning from certain people who didn't want you to know the counters to the techniques that they were teaching. Right. They had no counters. Um, and being a wrestler, having been a wrestler, you know, I, my mindset was never like, Oh, this is, this is really magic. You know, no, I was just like, no, this is wrestling. And, you know, I'm going to figure a way out of this. Um, sure. so, you know, one of the, one of my jujitsu mantras is it's mechanics, not magic. And so part of the, part of the goal I have as a professor, as a teacher is build systems that are conceptually understandable, um, that they have, um, a simple skeleton and then you put meat on them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you come to any one of my seminars, my hope is that white belt to black belt, they're going to leave with something. And it's not, I've been to some seminars where the first technique a white belt can handle and the last technique black belts struggle to handle. That's not how I like to structure mine. I like to structure mine so that from the front technique to the last technique of the day, everybody is getting something from it. Um, And I've, you know, I've built now over the last, oh my gosh, I forget when I did my first seminar, but let's say it was 2005. Um, it was probably, might've been before that, but I think it was 2005. I've built a notebook full of standardized seminars. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I have the outlines. And so when I, when I go, sometimes people say, Hey, I want to have you for a seminar. What are, what can I have? You know, well, I have a lot of them I have titled, like feel the pressure space to escape. You know, I have all these different like titles and then I can go in and I can teach to the outline um, and I can add the moves that I'm seeing people do today and uh, as sort of the bonus techniques or whatnot, but grappling, whether it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, whether it's wrestling, whether it's Sambo, whether it's Judo, I played all of these games. Um, they're all systems. They're all systems of getting to a specific goal. You know, so in in freestyle wrestling, the goal is to get the back exposed as many times as possible in a short amount of time as possible. Folk style wrestling, the goal is to pin a person. It's to get their back exposed and hold the back. You know, whereas in very very rarely in freestyle wrestling, do you see pins because if you can roll somebody five times, you've won, right? Yeah, tech fall. In folk style wrestling, if you roll somebody and they don't, they don't lay on exposure. You get no near fall points. You don't give, you don't get anything. The goal is to pin the person. Um, So there's two different systems that come under the exact same thing. Judo and 
uh, judo, if you look at judo as one technique or two techniques or three techniques, and they're not connected, your success rate is very low. Watch good judoka, good judoka, link things together with gripping systems and foot movement. And then it's, and then it's counters and then it's, you know, it's re-counters and re-attacks, but it's systems. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is no different. It is very much a system and you've got to figure out what the objective to the system is because the rule set right now, it depends on what game you're playing. Are you playing a submission game? Or are you playing a tournament advancement game? Um, and, you know, because there's different ways to play jujitsu, um, but you just have to, you have to build your systems within sort of the framework of what, of your, of what your top, I'm a top fighter. Like my goal, no matter where I'm at is to get to the top and then dominate from the top. It's a little bit being old school. It's a little bit being wrestler. It's a whole lot liking not to suffer underneath. So the, what I really value about good quality, um, instruction in jujitsu is somebody who says, listen, you know, 90% of this is going to be thinking about it. 10% is going to be doing. Um, and a lot of people disagree with me about that, but I'll tell you, if you go sit with world champions and I've sat with several of them and you watch them throughout a day, they are thinking, they're talking, they're brainstorming with their training partners uh, and they're, and then they're fighting and training. But I would tell you that they never stop thinking. They never stop sort of trying to put together, how am I going to solve this problem? You know, they get beat in a situation in training and they're, they, they're sitting in the locker room, just kind of like mulling it over, thinking about it. You know, some of them are taking detailed notes. I, um, there's a, there's a, a couple young guys out there that I know that, no matter what their training session is like, they're journaling it. Uh, and I, I tell my students to keep a jujitsu journal. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything complex, but we retain so much that we see, we retain so much that we hear, we retain so much that we do. But if you put it down in writing, or now we all have a phone, you know, there, mm -hmm. there was no notepad. Oops, that's my isn't she pretty? Uh, there is no <laughs> notepad. Um, when I started jujitsu, there was no notepad on a phone. So it was like actually having to write it out. I feel like a, a dinosaur, but now everybody can go and you can type in your notepad really fast. These are what, these are the things that we did, but that process engages your brain some more. And, and this isn't for anybody else to read. So people need to get over being self-conscious about, well, I spelled Kimura wrong, you know, because it's an easy word. I've watched people misspell it for years on blogs, but sure, who cares? So the other thing is, I, I, I caution, I caution white, blue, and purple belts all the time on be careful on what you're trying to learn. Um, white belts and blue belts tend to be in this sort of I want to learn more. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. Where's the Kool-Aid that's really going to taste good that's going to be good for me? Purple belts tend to, um, they tend to want to know which blade on my Swiss, Ar Swiss Army knife is the sharpest. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so they're always kind of playing with that. Uh, but uh, one of my favorite Brazilian Jiu Jitsu professors that I had the opportunity to learn under, I'm, I'm not like a formal student of his, but I've been studying him for as long as I can remember, Roy Harris. Mm -hmm. Not going to see a world, world title behind that guy's name, but he's one of the dirty dozen, one of the first American black belts. Uh, when I was, when I had my school in California, he came, he was there, he would come teach class occasionally there just out of the goodness of his heart, you know, just to come in and train with a bunch of us. And man, uh, he has a DVD called BJJ over 40 um, that everybody should own, but especially somebody who's, you know, post 35, just because it, it's, it's got, it's got a great mindset on how to train. It's got 
a framework, conceptual framework, fundamental things that you can do that, that keep you from um, falling into traps of the younger grapplers. And it forces younger grapplers into traps that they don't understand. Um, mm. But all of that is to say that a lot of my teaching style and a lot of my pedagogy, my methods come from observing really, really good instructors that don't say um, it's one move at a time. One of the reasons that I'm Andre Galval's student is because he's a systems guy. Um, he teaches super effective, killer, um, you know, for the last 10 years, you would call them cutting edge, um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu adaptations, but he can teach you why they work. And that was the big thing. Like yeah, some people say, Oh, well, they work because you're Andre Galval. You're, you're, you're just a great big muscular dude. Who's super athletic and, you know, is a professional athlete. I've, I've heard people say this and I just, I, I look at him and I say, okay, then why does it work for me? And how, why can he tell you that it works? He can, he can explain it to you. His method of teaching fit my sort of desire to absorb jujitsu. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody else does outlines. I would encourage everybody who's ever going to teach a seminar, put the effort into it. It's, you know, it's 30 sheets of paper that you have to print off typically. Maybe, maybe you're really popular and you have a bigger group. So it's more, <laughs> put, put the effort into it. It'll make you better as a teacher because you're going to say, okay, what am I going to go teach these people? How do I want to communicate this to them? And, you know, what's the day going to look like? Organized. But, you know, uh, something that really resonates with me, uh, once again, going to my background, um, uh, I was a flight instructor for a long time. And I'll toot my own horn. I was an award-winning flight instructor. Um, I uh, earned an FAA gold seal, which is uh, pretty hard to do. Um, means that you've put a lot of students through and their check ride pass rate is really high and you don't get to pick your students. So, you know, you, you get some knuckleheads and, uh, you get some, uh, Chuck Yeagers out there too. Uh, but you don't, you don't get to choose. So you got to work with whatever you got. And I was lucky that I worked within a very, very intelligent curriculum and I bought into the, the idea of progressive steps toward mastery within that curriculum. Um, as a student, it was, it was expressed to me in a way that made sense. And then as an instructor, I took that and was able to hand it off. And one of the concepts that we lived with, you said you come with a skeleton and then you put meat on the bone. And what we said is we move from the known to the unknown. And we're always attaching the, the unknown to the known. Mm -hmm. If I tell you something that is new to you and it's not related to anything else that you've done, it's very unlikely that you'll retain it uh, right. because you don't have anything to stick it to or relate it to. Um, and so in, in our case, the curriculum, the outline, if you will, was, was prepackaged. It was tested. It was vetted. You know, it was handed off. But I fell in love with that that idea and I'm hearing similar strains to you. You were looking for uh, teachers who, who taught in a way that, that gave that sense of uh, uh, organization and, and systemization, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and my first class with my instructor, cause I had, I had done some classes with, with a few others. Um, he just gave me, you know, like, this is our curriculum from white to blue belt, uh, which is such a simple thing. Uh, and I think it's the 36 techniques that Helio Gracie originally laid out as, you know, required to become a blue belt. And he said, all you got to do is be able to demonstrate these things against a resisting opponent. You'll be a blue belt. So it's going to take a while, but that's what's required. And to me, that was, I, I, I love that. I was like, this mm -hmm. is, this is there's structure here. I can, I can work with this, you know? Mm -hmm. And, so while I couldn't put into words at that time, the desire to look for systems, um, I could recognize 
uh, a strong curriculum. You know, I, I could recognize what, uh, what environment it was going to take for me to learn. Because I'm not necessarily, I mean, I, I, I tell this story about every time, but it's totally true. Uh, when, when my teacher, Michael, would be teaching the class and he would want me to move my right arm to the left, he would tell the class to move their right arm to the left. And then he'd look at me and go, now, Harrison, you're going to move your left arm to the right. And I would do the wrong thing from what he said, but it would be the right thing from what he wanted because he would just, you know, flip it for me because I just, I just couldn't catch stuff. It took forever for me to actually be able to, to pick up on things like that. Uh, such simple things. But go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no, no. Uh, speaking, speaking along those lines, a part of this show, because I, because I have learned things about what skill development requires from aviation, uh, in aviation, the weather is always working against you. The airplane, to a degree, every airplane is slightly different. So every airplane is, is asking something different of you that you have to react to. Um, the air traffic environment is always different. So uh, in jiu-jitsu, we might say your opponent gets a vote. And in aviation, there's a lot of votes. You know, they're all, they're maybe smaller than an opponent, but they are somewhat resistant. And so what I learned is, is in that environment, you know, it takes progressive steps toward mastery. You can't, you can't uh, fly into flying, so to speak. Um, and so this this podcast is is an investigation and if i wanted to get pretentious i might call it a meditation in how can i accelerate my learning as my learning potential is you know sort of in its in its peak like you know until i get to maybe 60 i think i can still pick things up at a pretty good clip and so uh the idea of diligent note taking another example of what I've learned from that uh, was that my note taking changed from, from the beginning to later. So I would, I would record every role. I would write down what happened in every role and use that as a data set to tell me what do I need to work on. And initially it would be real basic, like can't pass a guard, you know, that's not complex, but uh, within that is a, is a potentially a large set of problems. Maybe my knee cut pass, stinks or I want to practice that one. Well, now I've got to start solving a set of problems within that. So I loved what you said about uh, different, uh, you know, high level, we'll even say champions, after every uh, training session, looking, looking into their, their training and what happened, and then taking very, you know, meticulous notes about problems to solve within that. Uh, because I think that data set is very valuable. Uh, I don't learn a whole lot from free rolling, but I do get the chance to test what's working and what's not. And then from the notes, learn what I need to drill, what I need to situational spar, what I need to practice to get the reps in so that I can make those things work or potentially abandon and say, that one's not for me. You know, that, that can happen too. Okay. <laughs> This is what I was drafting. So here's another thing that you can do. So okay. I put, this says reverse arm bar. Okay. So I, I did this when I was a brown belt. Reverse arm bar was my best submission. So I put it in the center of a clock. My 12 o'clock, the place where I was hitting it the most was north south. Then it was cross side. Then it was from closed guard. Then let's say butterfly guard and then back mount. You know, you could add, I just, I really quickly did this. Yeah. But what I did was as a brown belt, I purposed, I said, listen, I'm going to go in tonight and I'm going to train getting from north south to my reverse arm bar. And I'm going to train that for as during my free rolls, during my my time where I'm I'm before class, after class, you know, that's what I'm going to train. Then the next, the next time period, let's say it was a week, a month or whatever, I was gonna I was gonna work my cross side reverse arm bar. So every time I was rolling, I was trying to get to cross side and then reverse arm bar cats. Mm -hmm. And then it was close guard. And then it, then it was there. And then what I started doing is I started going, I want to go from butterfly guard to close guard to here. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, I want to go from butterfly guard to cross side 
to here. And then I want to go butterfly guard to north south to here. And I, so I started drilling all of these different steps to get to my number one submission. And having that mind map, having that sort of, that built a whole system where, you know, you can ask, you can ask a lot of the people that I've trained with what my reverse arm lock is like, what my reverse arm bar is like. Um, and it's my A game. And it got to be my A game, not because fairy dust came down from the <laughs> arm bar wizards. It, it got to be that way because I said, I really like this. This works really well for me. How can I make it better? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then you can start to build like secondary and tertiary techniques out of that. But what that, that mind map did for me was it caused me to create my curriculum for my students that I used in California, which was fantastic. And the reason it was fantastic was it wasn't necessarily anybody could jump into any class and not be behind because the class was a flow chart of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So, you know, we may be teaching passing the guard and then we would, we would work passing the guard, passing the guard, passing the guard, passing the guard to cross side, passing, passing the guard to cross side. Pass, and then, and then we transition into cross side, top attacks, cross side, top attacks, cross side, top attacks to mount, you know, mount, mount, escaping mount. And so it didn't matter. We would go from the, the basic of that position to the advanced, advanced to the, the, the greater body movements of that position. So the nuanced, mm -hmm. very de little details up to the gross body movements where we're drilling it. Um, and we would, we would work that for a number of days. And so no matter where you came in, you got the basic. And then if you came in late in the system, you got the drill. But when you got the drill, it was going to take you someplace quickly. And then that next place, you were going to be settling in learning the basics and then learning the drills. And then we would go back and cover everything. And so we, it was, I think it was a whole, I forget how many different segments I had on that in that curriculum, but it's a map. And so my instructors, when I would have my instructors cover and I couldn't be there, they'd say, okay, we're on this day on the map. And it wouldn't matter whether somebody was a brand new green student with no gi, you know, they would come in, they would jump right in. They would learn the fundamentals of that position. And so I believe the best thing anybody can do, whether they are 20 or 18 or um, 60, is start to map your jujitsu. Um, I think that's, that's some of the best note taking that you can take is uh, particularly if you're a purple belt or above. You, you're as a purple belt, you should be speaking jujitsu. You know, at, the, at this point, you're speaking the language. Are you able to have really complex philosophical discussions about it? You may be getting there, but you, you're definitely able to communicate and work your way around jujitsu. So start mapping the areas that you like, the areas you struggle in. Um, you know, I think the the big thing I can say for anybody who's picking up jujitsu later in life um, is that jujitsu's three P's. Persistence, perseverance, and perspective. So persisting means you keep going. You know, mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's your one hour a day. I'm going to, I'm going to put my, I'm going to put jujitsu at least one hour a day into my life. Uh, that's persistence. Um, you can persist at something and it not have a good impact though. People persist at smoking cigarettes and, uh, <laughs> and, and it does them in. So persevering is the next thing. So you, you have to persevere. Jiu-jitsu sucks. Uh, it hurts. <laughs> you get sore. People, people pass you by. Um, people get belts. They don't, they, they, they get belts around you that you wouldn't think they'd get. They, they come up with skills that you're like, where did you come up with these skills? Um, you get injured. I mean, it, it's, 
it happens. Accidentally, it happens. I broke my big toe on a mat. Uh, you know, how in the world does that happen? I wrestled all my life and I, my big toe gets caught in the mat and I, it breaks. You know, um, the older I've gotten, so you, you measure a, a wrestler's life in dog years. Uh, you know, so I've been wrestling a long time, so I'm really, really old, but jujitsu guys have to figure that out and, and women have to figure that out too. You get hurt, your neck gets tweaked, you get, your rib gets popped. You, these things are going to happen. If you, I, I get frustrated when I hear certain people say, oh, jujitsu is for everybody and there's a way to train jujitsu so that you're going to be an old man and you shouldn't be injured. Yes, that's very true. But if you build expectations that you're not gonna get hurt, and you're rolling, I think it's, I think it's a fallacy. I mean, the way to not get injured in jujitsu is to not roll. Um, um, you know, rolling safe works until your toe gets caught in the mat. Uh, rolling safe works until, you know, all of a sudden you put your, you put your, your hand back and you base up and to do a, to do a technical stand up, And for some reason your elbow gives out. I mean, it's happened to me. Um, so you have to persevere and persevere means to come over a negativity. You persist mm -hmm. at training, you persist at thinking. And when you hit the bump in the road, when you hit the doldrum, when it, when it isn't really fun for you anymore because politics or pain or whatever, you persevere, you push through. But the other thing you have to keep is perspective. And, you know, this is one where I really wish I had had somebody tell me early on, keep it in perspective. Don't let jujitsu become your identity. It's a fleeting thing. You know, you're, you're an ACL tear from six months off the mat. And if your whole identity has been put on your jujitsu, you're, you're emptied, you know, um, you know, COVID has been just a horrible example of this to many of my friends, many of my friends who dumped every bit of themselves into being gym owners, who their, their whole identity, their whole career is on being a gym owner and a coach and they're broke. And, and, ha and having to figure out how they're going to survive. Uh -huh. You know, <clears throat> and, and jujitsu, I think, is very, very, very few people can really make jujitsu their identity and it have life substance, you know, through the end. I mean, and we can name, you and I can sit here and name the guys that can do it. You know, I mean, and that's, that's, that's sad. That, that, that so few of us can do that. But really, you got to keep it in perspective. Don't make jujitsu your identity. The other thing is, don't make jujitsu or the people in jujitsu or yourself in jujitsu idols that you worship. Mm -hmm. uh, they will let you down. They will fail you. They will be absent. You know, um, you've got to you got to keep this thing in perspective. There are when I was training jujitsu. When I first started, like I said, there were uh, jujitsu was magic. You know, the, the reason it worked for this guy and wouldn't work for this guy was because this guy had the Brazilian magic, right? And then you find out, oh my gosh, this guy's just like every other dude who is really tough, who has really honed this craft, who may or may not be a good teacher, but the guy still has faults and flaws. Don't yeah. idolize that. When you get to be good, when you get to be to the point where you're bringing students up, be careful not to create a situation where there's sort of leader worship. You know, one of the big things I've run from in jujitsu is leader worship. And that's why I love Professor Andre. If there are, if there was a, a guy who at, you know, in the last five years could say, hey, I deserve for you to come in and, you know, bow to me and you know i've won everything and i'm a physical specimen and i've written these books and i've done these dvds and i've got the best it would be him 
but he doesn't, he doesn't, there's no leader worship. Part of that's because of his faith. He definitely doesn't view himself to be a God. Um, so you, for me, I always try to make it so that I never wanted my students to come in and think, Ooh, I'm going to learn from Tim today. And Tim is the source and Tim is this. And, you know, because honestly, I'm not creative at all. Everything I've ever taught was taught to me. Mm -hmm. I'm just disseminating the information in a different way. And my ego though, loves to be stroked. And I love when people like tell me how good of a teacher I am or how tough of a, a role I am, you know, and that stuff really just pumps me up. But it also steers me wrong because when I get that way, then I, I'm not really helping them. They need to see that jujitsu is something that can be learned, that, that they can do, you can do the exact same things I'm doing. There's nothing special about me. Um, everybody can do exactly, can have the exact same jujitsu path I've done. You have to persist, you have to persevere, and you really need to keep it in perspective. If jujitsu gets in front of your, your family, you failed at jujitsu. If jujitsu gets in front of your faith, you failed at jujitsu. I mean, it, it, the, that's just straight up. You could be, I don't care what you win in jujitsu. If you scorch earth around you, you know, mm -hmm. you failed at jujitsu. Yeah, if, if you think of it as a, a tool for self-improvement, then just like you said, you scorch the earth in order to become as good as you can at it. Well, then you aren't necessarily improving the self all that much. You may have lost, you know, some of that element. Yeah. Uh, and, and I like what you said about, you know, oh, we get to learn from Tim today. Um, uh, I had a, a talk, I was talking with a couple of my teachers and one of the things that they said that, that I really liked is they didn't want anyone to think, you know, oh, how cool am I? You know, this thing that I'm teaching you, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm really special. It's like, no, we want you to get excited about the techniques. We hope that the techniques we teach are good and exciting, but it's not because I'm so cool. It's because when you figure this out, you will be able to do them, which will be really cool. You know, mm -hmm. so it's not, Oh, it, it comes from me. It snows. You will express this. So mm -hmm. that's the cool part. Not that you learned it from me, but that you can do it. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> it's a great, it's a great hobby. It's a great sport. It's a great martial art. Um, and it will keep you on your toes mentally and physically for as long as you want to stay in the game. It's a drug. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that I, I definitely felt that uh, with COVID. Yeah. It, it took about two weeks and then I started getting real weird with my kids and stuff like grumpy and pissy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, normally, especially cause I'm a traveling dad, you know, I, if I'm with my kids, I'm not real hard on them, you know, like mm -hmm. it, you kind of got to be a bit tough with sons because they, you know, testosterone needs direction. Uh, testosterone is an expressive hormone. And if you don't, if you don't guide testosterone into expressing itself heroically, then it'll express itself destructively. And so with sons, I think you got to be a little tougher than with daughters uh, until they, you know, <laughs> I got a 15 year old daughter. And, and man, it's, woo. but so, you know, I, I don't try to be, uh, I try very hard not to be grumpy and pissy with my kids because I want them when I come home, you know, they're, they're glad to see me. It's not like I'm disrupting their lives that they've been living while I was gone. Right. But I found that when, when COVID uh, closed us down, it took about two weeks and I got really weird. Uh, and so I started having to, just like work out in small, small batches about four times a day. So I'm, it's not like I'm, you know, hitting an hour on the treadmill four times a day, but I would take my kettlebell out and, you know, knock out uh, 50 kettlebell swings, 
and you know make a lap around the the the, the block and that would be one you know and then so just things like that and go out on my bike and take the kids on a bike ride for an hour or something yeah. I was walking the dogs like three miles a day you know two or three times a day like <laughs> my 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 big stinky dog you know that you know mr fartenstein like he, he was looking at me like bro we gotta quit this this is enough <laughs> yeah it's you know for me i i needed so i it, my goal for 2020 was to wrestle in um several different freestyle tournaments um and so January 2019 or 2020 I started like wrestling I had I put together a, a group of guys we were we were meeting in the mornings and they were putting me through the paces I was letting them coach me and um of course then in, in March Indiana shut down and mm -hmm. all the all the meets got canceled um I'm telling you, I needed, I needed the rest. My, my, my shoulder was jacked. My elbow was jacked. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling good again. You know, uh, I too, I use a, I have a rowing machine and kettlebells and a Bulgarian bag and Indian clubs. And, you know, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. The, the gym that I teach at and train at, they're back to training and, and teaching, but, um, you know, I have some, uh, this is, this is where perspective comes in again. Um, I have some people who are vulnerable in my family and then my parents mm -hmm. are older and I, I would just really rather see them, uh, than, than put myself at risk. And so kind of the guide that I've been using is, uh, when the high school athletic administration allows for, uh, contact, full heavy contact to happen again, then I'll be comfortable. But even then I'm tracking the numbers right now and they're, they're looking pretty bad for Indiana. We're, we're, we're up ticking and well, it's mm -hmm. going to be a little while, but, it, but it's perspective, you know, there, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. You're, you're uh, Chris Howder said it best, you know, you're going to, if you're going to be somewhere in 10 years, why not be a black belt? You know, so you're basically, you need to persist and persevere, but at the same time, it's not worth making my mom and dad sick. Uh, right you kill them they're in that demographic age of of it being fatal it's not worth making somebody in my family that doesn't need to be sick that who could easily get sick sick so you know you know I, a lot of my students are sending me messages like hey when are so we just so you know we do a morning class here called daybreakers it's at 5 15 and it, it's one that i run and it's hardcore like yeah there's no it's it's not a uh, it's not a fundamentals class it's not a basics class it's not it we're getting after it we're drilling hard it's it's rough we call it daybreakers and so a lot of the guys are like hey when are da when's daybreakers going to start back up and i think one of my one of my blue belts is leading it right now but i'm just like yeah i'm out for a bit yeah so you know perspective um, people have to keep that and there's there's huge challenges there because um, when you say perspective you're 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 choosing one thing that you love over another you know um, the right to see your family mm -hmm. in our case you know i have i have small children and um, we just we just don't go to grandma's right now uh, mm -hmm. and and that's that's not a jujitsu choice because we're we're not able to do jujitsu right. it's it's uh, uh I couldn't live with myself if I got my mom and dad sick and uh, you know, it's it just, it won't work. Um, there's big challenges on that front. I think based on some of the stuff that I've seen that we might get lucky and be within six months of a viable vaccine. Mm -hmm. And if that comes to fruition, then I think that we can get over the hump uh, and, I, and that'll be a really exciting time. Yeah, I got a bottle of uh, Woodford Double Oak that's waiting on that moment, you know, when I can get back and sweat it out with uh, the bunch of goons and cops and firefighters that smash me into the mat. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk. We'll talk bourbon uh, off there. Okay. Well, you, know, you Indiana folk, uh, uh, we'll allow that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna exclude you from the the, the bourbon uh, chats, but um, you know. One of the elements I, I, I love 
and maybe this is an attorney thing, you know, uh, I don't know, but the, the way that you, you know, you put it in, uh, the persistence, perseverance and perspective, it's very cogent and it's very simple. Um, and I being, you know, a Neanderthal like things that are simple. Uh, and, uh, so coming up with those things, you know, like giving people perspective is, does that come through the coaching as you were coming up or is this something that you found and then are trying to pass off, you know, and hand off to, to others? Persistent persevere has been like a, uh, a chant. So my, my, mar my brand of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is small axe Jiu Jitsu. It's the, um, S M A L L A X E. Um, and I used to have a website, like I said, it's down, but, um, it, it'll be coming back up at, at some point here soon. It has a lot of essays. I've written in 2009. I, I was on a writing streak. I wrote a, a bunch of essays that got uh, really good acclaim. Um, but persist and persevere has been a mantra of mine probably since 2010. Um, I think it came from having to answer the question that inevitably happens um, when people say, what do I got to do to get good? <laughs> what do I got to do to get good? Man, coach, professor, Tim, what do I got to do to get good? You got to persist and you got to persevere. I mean, that's the, that's the, the quick answer and persisting means if you're, if you're going to choose me to be your instructor, you got to trust my pedagogy. You got to trust my curriculum. You got to trust my, my formats. And, and if you don't trust those, guess what? There's a guy down the street that you can go train with and try his stuff out. And, you know, and I've always had an open door um, gym philosophy since I left my first coach. Um, you know, that was like something that ha I had to have. So I had to have this notion that I don't own my students. Yeah, they're paying. Um, right. They're, they're my customers. I'm a service right. provider for them. So uh, persist and persevere would be the first thing. And I was like, so you got to persist at this. And then, then telling them that, you know, the white belt to blue belt is just a slog. You know, you, you're going to get beat every day. You're going to get beat more than you win. And then all of a sudden you're going to win one. And then you're going to get beat for the next month. And then you're going to win another one. And then you're going to win a, a third. And you got to persevere. You got to keep coming back. And, you know, eventually you'll be a blue belt who's tapping white belts. And then you'll be a purple belt who's tapping white belts and catching some of the blue belts. And then eventually you're a black belt. And you persist and you persevere. However, I added perspective later due to a lot of like, you know, me not keeping perspective mm -hmm. um, due to, you know, having jujitsu jiu jujitsu cost me a lot of stuff and having just realizing that it can make me, you know, it, I have to be super cautious about even being on a podcast that I don't let this inflate my ego to where mm -hmm. I'm a jerk, you know, or to where, <laughs> you know, I come off as pretentious or a know-it-all or, you know, uh, better than somebody else or a, a bad mouth somebody else or pump myself up like, Ooh, I was on another podcast, you know, um, there you, yeah. well, this is a, a, a really tiny pathetic little podcast. So I, I wouldn't get too <laughs> excited about this one. <laughs> well, I, I I just have to be with jujitsu in general. I have to be real careful about that. I, I get that. And yeah. I, and I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I found that, um, that same thing in a way, uh, as a flight instructor, uh, because I was really, really a good teacher, but even as a really good teacher, I was not a perfect teacher. Mm -mm -mm. And sometimes, even though I was a really great teacher for the person that I was working with, 
I couldn't fit the scenario that they needed for what they were doing. Uh, and, and at first that would hurt my feelings. So if I had a student who was working in a, in a course that I was, I knew I was really, really good at teaching and they went with someone else, it would, it would, it would kind of trouble me, you know, like this student and I have a relationship and, and they know that I'm really good in this course. And one of my students, uh, I asked him, I was like, Hey, you know, I saw that you, you had, had asked for another instructor, which was admittedly pretty rare. Um, was there something that I did that caused that? And he said, no, not at all. You know, I knew that if I, if, if I got you, it would be just fine. The reason that I didn't want to go with you is I took a course similarly, similar to this one. This was an advanced course and he and I had done the basics course. Um, and he goes, I got a lot from you on that. And I fly now a lot like you. And I wanted to get someone else's perspective because I could go deeper into almost cloning your way of flying, or I could learn someone else's perspective and apply that to what I learned from you. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't like he picked, you know, someone else because he didn't think I could do a good job. It was because he literally wanted to get a different eye on it, what he had learned with me. And mm -hmm. once I, once I got that, you know, then I was like, almost telling all my students to do that. Like you need to go with somebody else. Like I can do a couple of lessons with you here and there if you want, but if, if I've already done with the course with you, then you probably need to learn from someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't know. I, I just, I, that perspective thing was not natural to me as an instructor because I took a lot of pride and I kind of defined myself as being really, really great at that. And so it was very, it took an emotional toll anytime something didn't work out. And, uh, um, I had, I had to grow a lot in that, you know, because it, it, it could have led to some disordered thinking if I didn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, so I had my gym in California at the exact same time I was running the Atos affiliates worldwide. I was professor Andre's director of Atos affiliates. So I was, bringing in people from all over the world to become affiliates, training them up in the system, um, working through the contracts, doing all of that. So as far as like, I was living my jujitsu dream. I wasn't even practicing law. This was, I went from being a, a, a homicide prosecutor, a chief deputy prosecutor in Indiana to, um, you know, living the jujitsu dream in San Diego. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, just a, a relationship failure. Um, not all mine, but a lot of mine probably. Um, and the bubble pops, you know, every, the, the wheels come off of that bus and, um, you know, I was blessed to have so many different people around me that were willing to support me and hold me up. But I really realized at that point that, you know, no matter what I thought of myself as a jujitsu professor, it really didn't have any lasting effect or impact on the real meaningful things in life. And so when I came back to Indiana, you know, I put jujitsu, like I'm, I'm muted. I, I hit mute. Like I didn't make posts on Facebook. I, you know, my website went down. I, I said, I want to fall back in love with jujitsu because I didn't like it much anymore. I love to train it, but I didn't like all the stuff that went along with it. And I didn't mm -hmm. like the, the me that, that was created from it. Um, and I, I started realizing I worshiped jujitsu. Like, um, I would, um, I would think about it nonstop. It would be the thing that I, I got my most value from. It was, you know, it, it was, it, it was an idol, you know, and, and I, I, um, you know, my faith, not to go real deep into that unless we want to, <laughs> my, my faith is uh, that I, I should bear no idols, before, uh, you know, there should be no idol before God. And, and so when I realized, oh my gosh, 
not only is jujitsu an idol, but when I'm around jujitsu, I put myself up here and I worship myself. Mm -hmm. I was like, brother, I got to get that in under control because that's just straight up going to cause significant problems for me eternally. Um, and it was leading people down the wrong paths and all of these different things. But the, one of the things that you said that really resonates with me is as you become an instructor, because if you're going to progress in jujitsu, you're, it, it's just going to become natural that you end up teaching, you know, a brown belt and a black belt who don't teach are weird to me. Like <laughs> it's just it's strange. I, when I, when I see a brown belt who doesn't help out in class, well, number one, they're not my brown belt. Uh, you know, I don't, everybody who's gotten a brown belt from me is on an instructor path, you know, and so I don't know what that's like. And nobody in our gym where I train, I, it's just not part of the culture I've grown up around. But anyway, uh -huh. when you become an instructor, you need to make sure that people are, are taking your technique and weighing it against somebody else's technique. Another person you should have on your show at some point in time and talk to is Evan Manweiler. Um, he, Evan is a, a black belt, um, under me, he got it from Professor Andre, but it was through me. And um, he and I disagree on so much in jujitsu. <laughs> and you know, we 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 both teach. We would both teach at the same gym, and he would tell he would tell the students he'd be like, "Yeah, Tim doesn't agree with me on this, but this is how to do it." And then I would come in, I'd be like, "Yeah, Evan doesn't agree with me on this, but this is how I do it." And the students loved it because they're like, okay, well, let me try it this way. And for a certain number of the kids, you know, Evan's, Evan's way was better. And for some other kids, my way was better. It just, um, since he's not been on the show, we'll say most of the time it was your way. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he knows I'm right. He knows I'm right. We've talked about it. If he's from Kentucky, we, we might have to, you know, fudge a little bit, but. <laughs> yeah he lives in chicago now he I, I tell you what that that guy right there is a he's a um just a super solid gym that nobody knows about like um people in chicago know about him and um but he i mean so wise such a good a good coach a good instructor again i mean i don't the last time he competed may have been at a bluegrass open in Louisville. And I'm thinking maybe 2006, he had a purple belt. It was a purple belt match, mount him. And he had a bat choke on the guy. Mm -hmm. The guy mounted him and uh, Evan put the guy to sleep and they got the guy quit jujitsu. And I don't think Evan's ever competed again. <laughs> oh my like, God. He didn't want to hurt the guy's feelings. <laughs> you know, one of my, one of my best friends and, and a teacher of mine, uh, he's a black belt now. When he was a blue belt, he was in a competition and had somebody in mount. And they uh, put him to sleep with a cross choke. And he, he goes, I remember thinking, there's no fucking way. <laughs> and then he's like, and then they're waking me up. <laughs> Yeah. yeah I've, I've been blessed i've never gone to sleep from a choke in a tournament i got i got knocked out a uh, andrew sabins and i were uh, competing against each other at an extreme grappling open 2004 i think and he did a he did an arm drag on me from standing and we clanked heads mm -hmm. and i don't remember the rest of the match i won but i was knocked cold knocked me yeah. out cold. uh yeah, I was on the farm one time when I was a kid and I was in the barn and we'd gotten this new tractor that had a roll cage over the, the, mm -hmm. you know, the driver compartment and we had pulled an engine from something else. So there was a chain hanging from one of the tier poles with a hook on it. Mm -hmm. I was backing up to get a set of plows and that hook caught my uh, roll bar and so I'm just backing up, you know, and I don't see what's going on over my head. And it pulled that tear pole down and it just like clipped me on the side of the head. 
So I spent the whole day bush hogging, you know, just doing whatever I did. I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I woke up the next, I woke up the next day and was like, I got to go bush hog. And dad's like, you, you, you did it all. Yes. Well, <laughs> what? <laughs> Nowadays they'll, they'll check you out for CTE and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to report that to the FAA as a, uh, you know, like a history of unconsciousness. So if anybody yeah. from the FAA watches this, uh, you know, I, I has is reported. So it's on there. It's in the book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you know, what you're talking about there is that's, that's exciting to me. The idea of, you know, this is the way I do it. And, uh, I think his name was Evan. Evan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Evan, Evan don't like this, you know, but that's, that's, um, First off, that doesn't build syncophants. That gives your students, um, it gives them uh, a subjectness, you know, where they're they're in charge, they're in the, the driver's seat. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things that, that this podcast has taught me is that um, over and over, high-level coaches, um, PTs have all said, you have to be in the driver's seat. You can't you can't allow someone to supplant your thinking. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there's a cultural element there. That's very important. If, you know, if you create a culture where people are active participants and that's incentivized, then that, that helps that. But even just that, that interplay one off each other and say, look, this is, you know, the way Evan does it is this, the way I do it is this, you know, it could be, a physical difference. It could even be something as much as a personality difference. Um, you know, uh, I find that, that I tend to, my first instinct is to bridge. I'm like a wrestler, even though I never wrestled, I just always want to bridge. Um, that probably comes my previous background, you know, sport wise, I, I was a power lifter. So heavy deadlifts, kettlebell swings. I have a really explosive bridge even though I'm not a really explosive person, that one element of my movement is really strong. And I trained that, you know, for years. So for someone else, that bridging motion may not be that effective because they don't have that, that background. And I'm definitely not as strong uh, as I was previously, you know, Mm -hmm. in, in hip extension and whatnot, but that motor pattern is still there and it's still powerful. So even slightly differences like that can make, one, a technique effective for one person, but completely useless for someone else. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes I think it's easy to sort of get lost in the weeds sometimes with instruction too. <clears throat> so take, for example, I think, and I think this is actually one of the details that Evan and I disagree on, <laughs> but, but we both can articulate why we're right. And I think that's the fun thing about it. So if you're doing a Kimura from north south, okay, and the person is on their side, so you have a leg in front of them and a leg behind them. Mm-hmm. When I'm at and their head is underneath your underneath your butt, you're looking at their legs, right? Yeah. Okay. So when I'm attacking a Kimura from north south, my leg that is on their back is knee up, foot down, but out. So it's like a kickstand. Okay. Okay. So you're chalking the top scapula so that Correct. they can't roll flat. Correct. Okay. My knee that's on the front side is stapling their arm and, and, and driving in so that I'm holding them up onto their side with my knees. And then my arms are free to be doing whatever they want, you know, playing all sorts of games or just straight up Kimura. Okay. That's my, my method of Kimura. He is knee down on the back, knee down on the front as well. So both knees down. Mm -hmm. Okay. He can articulate why he's right. I can articulate why I'm right. And the, the big thing that the students need to see is the goal is the person doesn't flatten out. Mm -hmm. If you do it Evan's way, the person doesn't flatten out. If you do it Tim's way, the person doesn't flatten out. Which way do they flatten out least? probably depends on all the different variables that lead you to the point, but you can get lost in the weeds. And if you have one instructor who is using leader worship or, or who says, 
I am the expert and I am the only source of knowledge in this room and you shall do it my way. And if that were me and Evan came in and Evan said, man, every time I put my knee up, the guy slices right underneath and boom, something isn't working. Maybe my knee to uh, uh, ankle bones, radius and ulna, maybe, I think those are right. No, tibula and fibula. Oh my tib God. And fib, yeah. Tib and fib. <laughs> maybe my tib and fib are, are too long or too short compared to your tib and fib. You know, who knows what it is? But if, if you don't allow for the exploration, if you get into the weeds and the minutia too much, then you, you stunt growth and creativity. And mm -hmm. I think, I think there's less of that now than when Evan and I were coming up, you know, when Evan and I were coming up, you had to do it a certain way or you were doing it wrong. Yeah. Now I do believe there are some things that you can do wrong. And sure. I believe, that, and I believe there's mechanical answers for it all day long, but then there are other things where it's, you can just do things differently and, uh, and, and figure out what works for you. And, and, you know, uh, the, you know, how to set up a rear naked choke. I mean, there, there's lots of different ways to set up a rear naked choke. You can look at how Marcelo Garcia sets up his rear naked choke is different than how professor Andre sets up his rear naked choke. And, you know, um, and you can just find all, or how Braulio uh, Estima sets up his. I mean, there's all these different ways that it can be done. But there's, there's also wrong ways. I mean, you know, there, there's ways of going over the face and, you know, and smothering the face. And while that works in a fight, it's a wrong, it's wrong for the technique because the goal of a rear naked choke is double carotid restriction. You know, you want to sure. get the neck in there. So, you know, I mean, there's, uh, with Evan, I mean, Evan, and I think there's, there, there are several other little things where it's basically that sort of thing. You know, I, I say, you can't cross your feet here. And he says, sure, you can cross your feet there and all, all, all different goals. I tend to have a very conservative jujitsu where as I try to make as few risks as possible, Mm -hmm. And you may say, well, we'll take this risk here because if the person does the technique that you're in danger for, then we have this opening. Right. Um, and, and so there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different reasons. The, the big those thing, are personality differences. That's, that's not a technical difference or a, a biological, we'll say body type difference. That's just differences in personality. Your, your personality likes zero risk, just shut things down and, and give the person no options. Mm -hmm. His personality is, yeah, we'll, we'll give him an option, but it's going to be a bad one. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, and, and uh, it, it, it makes it, it makes it fun to have variations. And, and, and another, another sort of um, explanation of how uh, jujitsu varies on personality types. I don't want to create a bunch of mini me's because I want to, I want to create a jujitsu that works for, when I'm teaching jujitsu that works for a 15 year old girl and a 70 year old man, and then everybody in between. And if I create a Tim sled pattern of jujitsu, it's only going to work for a certain body type guy with aggressive wrestling who wants to smash and use his forehead as a post and, you know, all of these different things. And, you know, uh, Lydia uh, was one of my, youth students when I had my school in Bedford and you know she came in and I was like oh man this is really this is going to test me can I <laughs> can I teach I mean because I'm like this is my first like young female student who is talks like this and like mm -hmm. oh no man but she got tough because the drip so I I watched her she was a guard pass back take she didn't want to be cross side. She didn't want to be mount. She wanted to take the back and then she was choking guys very early on. So, you know, we just worked with her, the, the instructors and I just worked with her on, you know, let's drill your guard passing so that you, every time you pass the guard, you're on a path to the back. You know, sometimes you're not even passing the guard all the way. You're just passing the guard into a half guard because then you can, you can do a dump over and take the back. And right. Um, 
So you do, I think gauging, learning how to gauge your students and, and give them jujitsu that they can create their own is, is really important. Um, my fav, I did a summer camp um, at my gym one time and the, for the students that were participating in the summer camp, I made them tell me what their favorite position was, their favorite submission, their worst position and and the technique that they got tapped with the most often so when they when they were filling these sheets out i think they just thought i was having them analyze their jiu-jitsu game but what i did was i took the sheet and i i made them work uh i created for each one of them techniques and drills to get from their worst position to their best position to their best submission and for the whole camp I just built their path to success because if you can get from your worst position to your best position to your best submission, you've got jujitsu. I mean, mm -hmm. so, you know, for, for me, um, being underneath the bottom of cross side, despite the fact that being on top of cross side is my best position, being on the bottom of cross side is my worst position. So, so, you know, for me, it's all about, then having, having the ability to work myself into a position that I can then get the sweep or whatever. So for all of the students, and I had I think 12 or 13 different students in that camp, they all had a different camp. But by the end of the camp, they all were drilling gross body movements through the whole cycle. And once you've learned how to play that strategy, then you play it from another way, or you add a different variable to it and you just, you got to keep making it fun. But as an instructor, that's kind of what you should be doing every time you're watching your students roll. When you're watching your students roll, it shouldn't be to see who wins or loses. It should be to see what are they doing well, what are they doing poorly. Uh -huh. And once you run out of students who are doing something poorly, uh, you quit because you've quit <laughs> being able to analyze what's going on, you know. Um, uh, one of my favorite things to do as a, as an instructor was have world-class athletes come in to visit. And then I would wrestle, I would, I would, I would spar with those world-class athletes in front of all of my students. Yeah. It never worked out well for me. Right. I mean, all these guys kill me. JT Torres, Keenan Cornelius, Josh Hanger, Tom. Bunch McKinney. of chumps. Yeah, <laughs> Huey, Huey from Louisville. I mean, these guys just work me over and kill me in front of my students. It's so good for my students to see because on the day-to-day -day grind, they think, oh, man, Tim's tough. Or Professor Tim, nobody in, in class can beat Professor Tim. Or, uh, or right. when, when somebody catches Tim, we don't know whether it's true or not. You know, we don't know mm -hmm. whether he gave it to us or not. But then, like, you know, these these guys come in and and I, I fight them hard like I I just I really don't want to lose to them and they still tap me um uh Thabit Altahair from um the UAE he's another another guy that I love to whenever he comes in and, and trains we spar in front of the students because I just want them to see what it's like for their to watch their coach to analyze their coach or their professor getting mauled manhandled um and in, you know and then of course humiliation and humbling is very important for an instructor <laughs> well, you know something that you said about the the camp idea that's that's a thing that any of us could do individually in our own jujitsu like I, I don't need to go to a summer camp i could put together a three-month camp where i want to be able to get so my worst attacking position is either or my worst submission, I would say, uh, is a straight arm bar. For whatever reason, I just I don't I haven't figured that one out. Okay. Uh, and second worst would be just attacking from the back. Now there's uh, I'm pretty good in the crucifix, uh, uh, but I normal back attacks I, I have a hard time finishing. Uh, and then on the bottom position that I you know, have the hardest time with. I would say if someone has a really, really good, and I'm not talking 
your standard jujitsu guy. I mean, like a, a good judo uh, player with a case of gatami mm-hmm. that will just crush the life out of you. And like, you just can't, it, it's like your brain goes, goes numb and you can't even think. Um, that's one I, I, as a purple belt, I don't think I want to tap the pressure anymore, but it's, it, it could happen. I think still with the right person, uh, if they had even just a little bit of a weight advantage on me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but if you look at those positions, um, the bottom of case of and the arm bar and the back are all related positions. Uh, mm-hmm. if, if you can make the transitions between them. Uh, so I can very conceivably, and I think, you know, maybe I need to do this, put together a three month camp where I'm just going to deal with Kesa getting out of it to the back or to arm locks and then work just, you know, on attacking from the back and arm locks, because those are three things that if I got rid of them being weaknesses, I'd be a whole lot tougher to deal with. Yeah. What's your best position? Um, Best position, I would say the the side close guard right now is something that, you know, I, I feel pretty good with. So it's basically like a close guard arm drag. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. So that that far side arm, arm lock, uh, I think, mm-hmm. is what you were talking I feel really good with that and uh, chaining, chaining with that. Uh, potentially uh, like a 411 or saddle position. Uh, okay. I'm pretty pretty tough to deal with there. Um, uh, and then, uh, I think that's, those are the two that I would, that I would feel if I was, if I was going to say, Harrison, you got to roll with a black belt today, you know, and, and you gotta, you gotta try and tap them. That would be the two places that I would have the best chance, which is not to say that I would, but if I was picking that would, that would be where I needed to be. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, none of, I mean, just like you said, you don't need a, there shouldn't, you don't need a camp to, to, to put that together. You know, you can do it yourself. These are, these are the, um, there are four modes and I, I have an essay written about this that'll be published when I get my website back up. There are four modes of learning Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Okay. The first mode is the technical mode. That's your going to class. Professor uh, articulates the technique you pair off into your buddy group, you and your buddy group rep the technique, making sure you've got all the details right. Some schools call that drilling, but I don't call that drilling. Drilling is a term of art that we're gonna discuss here in a second. So technical mode, you know, it's, it's you know, that's what you're doing. That's one way of learning jujitsu. Second way of learning jujitsu is drilling. Drilling is different. Drilling is, um, exercising a gross body movement for a number of reps in the least amount of time. So you're, you know, like you're doing uh, speed drills, like as as fast as you can do the gross body movement of of any movement um, so that your, your body becomes willing to pull a trigger on a gross body movement without you having to think and then you can then add in the, the refined details that you worked during repping once you've gotten to where you need to go. So drilling is really important. That's another way to learn jujitsu. Specific sparring. So specific sparring is the type of sparring where your adversary knows exactly what you're going, you, that your goal is. You're locked into a set rule. So like, um, for example, some people go, pass, sweep, or submit. So you, you, you start with one person on their back in a version of guard. Their job is sweep or submit. Top person's job is pass. And once one of those is done, then you reset or you pair off. That's specific sparring. So when I'm on the bottom, I know the person on top, their only job is to pass. They're not trying to submit me. They're not trying to get me to stand back up and wrestle. Their job is pass. My job is sweep or submit. So I know when I'm passing the guard, the person on the bottom wants to sweep or submit, or maybe, maybe the drill is um, uh, mount attack, mount escape. You know, it's a so it's specific sparring, very locked into a certain rule set. And then the last way of learning jujitsu is with um, uh, is open rolling. 
you know, slap hands, bump fists, and go for it. So any one of those four modes can be used in isolation. You could have a technical only training of jujitsu where you'd never spar, you never drill, you never specific spar, and you can learn jujitsu. It's going to take you a very long time to become mm -hmm. a Okay. You're going to learn jujitsu. You may become an encyclopedia, but you or me walks in to somebody that's been doing only that for two years uh, and we're going to wreck them. Right. Um, you can be a, you can go to a school that only drills. And uh, so all you're doing is gross body movement, fast movements, kind of the, the, the big picture, but never the, never the detail. And you can, you can get really tough at jujitsu. You can become a great sport competitor because you can probably score a lot of points. Your submission game is going to be really off because submissions require refinement. You know, they're, uh, you know, like right now people will jump on heel hooks and they don't really even have to know what they're doing. They just kind of jump on a heel hook, make it look good. And people tap because they don't want their knees to get wrecked. Right. But then you watch somebody that really knows how to do a heel hook. You watch like a, a, a Dean Lister uh, or an Eric Paulson. You watch those guys teach heel hooks. And I mean, uh, you watch John Danaher and uh, you watch how he teaches how to do heel hooks. There's so many details into how to do it right and make it effective versus just scary. Um, and uh, same thing with like your arm lock. You know, there, f f to get good at your arm lock, you're going to need to pay attention to some technique on it. You're going to talk to your professor and, and have, a, have your professor and your training partner go over it with you. So you're going you're gonna to technique it. You're going to need to drill your entries because probably what's happening is when you're rolling and trying to attack it, you're giving a tell of some sort. You're, you're doing something where the person you're trying to attack the arm lock says, oh, crap, he's coming for my arm. And they get their elbow tucked before you can get your hips under it. You know, right. so you're going to drill your entries so that you become so slick on your entry that you're hitting your entry before they even hit, realize they need to tuck the elbow. Um, so, so drilling is important, but you drilling itself isn't good alone. And then specific sparring, man, specific sparring just sucks. I mean, it's boring and, and it's hard and the success rate's so low that you're going to lose the love. And then you get mm. the other guys, which I call the garage trainers, where, you know, the guys that only spar. They get really, really tough because all they do is fight each other. And so they're like this, you know, and they come in and you're like, oh, man, you've been training in a garage, I can tell, because <laughs> all you want to do is spar. But they have no technical knowledge. There's no refinement. You know, they can't last um, once you cancel their A game. Um, so there's four modes of learning jujitsu. And if you take and build like what you, like we were talking about, you take and you build a three week camp, you just got to do all of those things. You need to study the techniques that you're doing, the positions that you're doing on your flow chart or on your map out. You need to drill so that you're getting against time and against resistance. You're getting the movements in that you need. And you just specific spar it and you need to say, okay, okay, Joe, um, today I'm ready. So my job is going to be to get out of your case of Gatami. I want you to keep me in case of Gatami. Don't transition to something else. You know, I know you're going to see, I'm going to open up and you're going to be able to knee over on the mount. Don't do that. I just want you to hold case of Gatami and, and tap me from Kesa, and I'm going to try to escape specific spar you have to have a good par training partner to do that with that's going to honor that yeah but then, but then you specific spar it and then what you do is and i always tell my students this then in your open rolling you don't tell anybody what you're doing but you put yourself in that position and you work your way out and you fail and you fail again and you keep working your way out to the point where now you know i call it babe roofing like i'll, I'll go into i'll go into spar and i'll be like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna tap your left arm don't let me tap your left arm that's my way of drilling against resistance i'm, I'm like i'm telling you i'm not i'm not going to choke your neck uh i'm not going to tap you out from pressure i'm not going to you know wrist lock you i want your left elbow 
And so all they have to do is protect their left elbow and all I got to do is dig it out. And, it, you know, and then, so there's doing, once you really get good, you can start Babe Ruthing the whole situation. But um, you, walking yourself and using the four modes of learning jujitsu will really help, especially if you want to like train jujitsu. Like if you mm -hmm. just want to know jujitsu and you want to like play jujitsu, that's okay. But if you want to train it, then you've got to think about how to make the systems work for you. Yeah, no, I, I want to train it because I want to roll dangerously. <laughs> It's uh, one of our stated goals here. Um, right. And I, I like the, uh, the, the breakdown there. I think the main thing from my training that I, I have been missing that, we've, that I've really introduced in the last year has been a lot of situational sparring. I was doing that in, in rolling just by, just like you said, taking myself to the positions that I wanted to work in and then, you know, basically eating crap until I got good enough that that didn't happen anymore. Uh, but you know, it, it, it could be done in a lot more, uh, organized fashion and, and, you know, quicker learning curve. But I have experienced exactly what you were talking about when you were saying it's hard because you're just basically losing. Like, you know, if, if, if I'm trying to work out a case of Gatami and I'm having someone who's good at it, put me there over and just keep me there it is not fun. Like it's, it's, it's almost demoralizing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what you have to do, what I've had to do, and I can't speak for anybody else, but I've had to just use that, that, you know, creative reframe and say, I'm being exposed to a very high level of resistance. And even if I can't beat this resistance, if I get to 80% on this resistance, anybody who's below 80%, I can beat you know, in, in this spot. And so you have, it, it's very hard to take that emotional kind of, you know, slide down the roller coaster and just stay at the bottom. There's no coming back. Right. Uh, Cause you're just down there in the pit. Um, but uh, just doing that, like I said, the, the, the reframe has been valuable to me and, and just, you know, one of the themes of this conversation has been trying to find ways to, to, purposefully and, and forcefully reinstill humility and uh, reframing and staying in the pit is kind of one of those things. Yeah. Persist and persevere. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's uh, you know, and when I, I often, so the other, you know, purposeful, you, you use the term purposeful and um, a lot of my students gag when that word comes up because <laughs> it's, it's one, it's part of, it's part of every one of my mat chats, you know, at the end of the night, we're all sitting there. We can't even tie our geese anymore. And, you know, I say, listen, you got to purposefully train every time you get on the mat, we have a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. Every, everything you're doing needs to be purposeful. Um, you know, I, I have a rule before my classes. Um, I don't, I don't ever want to walk on the mat and see people like jaw jacking. And so for daybreakers, and, and this is particularly for daybreakers now for a normal, like evening class where you've got, where you're, you're hoping to build the camaraderie and right. you know, family vibe and all of that, yeah. you know, cool allow, allow for a little bit of that. But for my daybreaker class, no, we're, if we're coming at 5.15 in the morning, nobody wants to talk. You know, everybody wants to talk because everybody want, doesn't want to do work. But our point is we're walking in that door to, to do some serious training. So the rule is, is from the moment they get there until the moment class starts, if they're on the mat, they've grabbed a partner and they're working through something. They're, they're, you know, they're repping, drilling, or specific sparring. And, and if they're not, they get a humongous lecture about purposeful training. <laughs> you know, and, and, and even if they do, then after class, I'm just like, that's exactly what you should be. And, and you get to create, you, you mentioned it earlier about creating culture. You get to create that culture. If, if, if the culture at the gym is the professor takes everybody's cards as they walk in 
and, and greets them and does everything right that a professor is supposed to do, making sure everybody's safe, everybody's clean, everybody's mm -hmm. checking in well, that means all the students are mingling. Okay. Mingling can look like, Hey, how's, how's work going? You know, your, your motorcycle's really cool, man. You know, it, it can look like all kinds of different stuff. I tell my students, if you're one of my students, mingling looks like, Hey, I really want to work this. Come over here. Mm -hmm. And you start to create a culture because what happens is out of the corner of their eyes, these other people that are talking about the flavor of their, you know, their gelato they're having after they look over and they're just like, Oh, he's working that. That's the same crap he hit on me last time we rolled. Yeah. And then, or they like watch you do something. And then when you're rolling with them, you do that thing. And they're like, Oh man. And I mean, it starts to click that in these limited minutes that we have to practice this thing that we're paying money for or devoting our energy to or spending time away from our wife and kids for, oh, those minutes include the time before professor walks on the mat and summons us. You know, I mean, so why shouldn't we make it purposeful? And so I tell my guys, like, when, because in our, in our town here, you can go to the university club it's free or, or very inexpensive. You can go to Dax Rosano's gym. Uh, he's another guy here in town. We don't, we don't care if you train at his place on nights where you can't train here. But all, we, all I say is, listen, when you're there, it better be purposeful. You know, you need to be practicing. You need to be, you know, making friends. You need to be doing everything you need to be doing. But don't waste your jujitsu time because you're going to run out of it, you know. We want to be rolling dangerously at 65 or 72, but you know what? That, those days are going to come like a puff. I mean, you, you know, you're a dad. You start measuring your life in your, by your kids' years, and, and life speeds up. Yeah, you know, I got a 15-year-old. It's like last week dude, she, she was saying, uh, uh, Daddy, hold you. You know, yeah. she couldn't say, hold me. Yeah. She would put her arms up and say, daddy, hold you. Yeah. And I, I'm, now I'm looking at this kid who rolls her eyes every time I want to give her a hug. Yeah. You know? And dude, she's going to graduate from, from high school next week. You're yeah. I mean, literally, literally she's going to graduate from high school and you're going to be like, man, Tim told me that was going to happen. And you know, I mean, it's like, it's next week. So we, we got a limited amount of time to do it. Take advantage of the time when I call the mats a sacred space, you know, because on the mats, there, rarely in any other place can there be true honesty. Like somebody can get away with a little fib here or a lie there, you know. I mean, um, I could tell you right now that I was a state champion wrestler. Uh, you may believe me. You may not believe me. I believe you. <laughs> one of your one of your listeners may believe me, may not believe me. It's a lie. I'm not a state champion wrestler, never was. <laughs> but I can say it right here because I'm sitting in a chair talking into my computer screen to somebody who doesn't know me. And, you know, whoop de doo You and I get on a mat together and you put on a black belt. We're going to know really quickly whether you're a black belt or not. <laughs> <laughs> um you know it it the, you can't well lie. i got a i got a bad knee so yeah you know. <laughs> <laughs> well you might be then you might be a black belt <laughs> um, but you know i mean the mats you can't lie on the mats it's a sacred space so when you step into that sacred space use it for what it's there for i mean um you know and it's there for honest labor it's there for persistence it's there for perseverance it's there for perspective because, you know, some dude from another town who wear, has the exact same belt color you have who moves there is going to come in and is going to have a different game. It's going to wreck your shop for six months and you can quit. I mean, that's people do it all the time. They, they can't handle it. You know, that's why. That's, that's what I plan on doing. Yeah. Wolf kicks my butt. <laughs> yeah no you're not going to i mean because you're going to persist and persevere and you're going to keep perspective you're going to be like well, listen that all things being equal if i were 32 and had the same belt this guy has i, I could hang 
but this is a different, I have a different set of variables and, and, you know, some will be good and, and, and there will be people that you whip. You're going to tap black belts and you can, and when you tap black belts, you can, you can march around like this and you can get all excited and you will be excited. You're going to be excited when you catch your first black belt. If you haven't caught your first black belt, you're, you're going to think, Oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing in the world. How you behave tells a lot about who you are because guess what? I got, I've been tapped by blue belts in the last 365 days. If I'm not training with them and training right with them and training hard with them, then, you know, what's the point of training with them? And so, you know, Ty Ray is uh, one of, one of my blue belts here and the, he, I gotta, I gotta watch out. He'll catch me. Um, you know, and, it, and I can't ever like say, oh, I, I let you get me that time. You know, yeah. <laughs> unless, I, unless I did, but I'm telling you, he knows when I haven't. And, you know, I, there's no shame for me in getting caught. It's, that's the beautiful thing about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You know, do I, it, it, should it happen every class? No, there's something wrong if it's happening every class. But if I'm exposing myself in full combat and, you know, and letting it, letting it all flow. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not hiding any of my zones. Then I should be getting caught. I mean, Marcelo Garcia said that to me when I went out and trained with him in 2010, he was just like, if you're not getting caught in your training, you're not training, right. You're not, you're not exploring the boundaries. And what I've taken from that and sort of the way that I, I, you know, I, I view that as in our lives, we all have these areas that we like to push into the shadows. You know, we, we got the thing we want people to see, you know, our mm -hmm. A games, you know, when we, you know, when we walk out in, uh, to go get our, our mail in the, in the morning or, or pick up our paper from the driveway, you know, most of us are probably not wearing the exact thing we went to bed in. You know, we're, we're, we're going to throw a robe on, you know, or something like that. You know, there's, there's, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty hot. So I... there, there you go. There you go. It gets worse. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, we have our A game. When I go into court, I'm wearing a suit and tie. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm, sh I'm looking sharp. Um, and, you know, I'm not wearing my Atos t-shirt and, you know, so the court a game yeah or my <laughs> rainbow puking clown t-shirt just uh, for the listeners if if you haven't shown you the shirt this is my uh signature series rash guard here the clown vomiting the love rainbow it. love it because uh, i like to look sharp too <laughs> <laughs> exactly but but in jujitsu we can have our a game and especially as you start to come up the ranks like purple belt prior right around purple belt there's going to, there's going to be a lot of sort of, uh, when you're rolling, not, not exposing your shadows, you know, cause, oh my gosh, if a blue belt taps me, am I really a purple belt? Or, oh my gosh, if a white belt catches me, am I really a purple belt? And so, like you said, let's say your case of game is, is a shadow zone. It's where you're not very good. You know, if you don't ever play that area, it'll stay a shadow game. And then you'll be mm -hmm. a black belt with a really crappy case of escape. Yeah. And, and that's, you don't want to be that. You want to be a black belt that says, oh, I'm not scared. You know, for me, like, I'm, I'm not scared to have people on my back because I knew I sucked at having people on my back when I was a brown belt. And so, you know, I started like figuring out ways to let people take my back and then I would defend and escape and, you know, play systems off of that. Um, the, the less shadows you have, the more light you can shine into all of your jujitsu areas, the better you're going to be. But that means you're going to get beat and you're going to get beat by people that aren't as good as you or aren't as technical as you or don't have as many years as you have. Um, you, you know, this, this reminds me of something that my dad told me when I was a kid, you know, we were farmers, right? Not a lot of fun. Dad, Dad did a lot of construction, but he also did some farming. And I don't know where he got it, but it's it stuck with me. Son, the finest of all fertilizers is shit. So if you want your gardens to grow, 
you gotta there's gotta be some shit around and uh so just like you were saying those shadows like that's basically avoiding the shitholes you know that's i mean to put it you know in in one way if you really want if you really want to grow then you got to eat that shit sandwich uh and you got to eat it until it's not that anymore uh it's not fun um I, I like that even goes with the idea of purposeful training, you know, is that, you know, uh, we interviewed Emily Kwok uh, recently and, and she was talking about when she won her first world championship, basically she had an A game and nothing else, but that A game was good enough and nobody knew about it. And it took her to, you know, the, the podium. The next year she lost every match that she competed in. Uh, because people found the holes. And so it was a hard ride to work on all those weaknesses and get mm-hmm. back. But she came back and, you know, won, I think she won Masters Worlds maybe a few years after that. You know, and there, and there were some cultural elements and some troubles that she had and, you know, normal life struggles. Yep. But but the the biggest part was that, you know, she – first rode this wave to a championship of just having like a, a killer a game that nobody could shut down. Sorry. I don't know if you lost me there for a second, but nope, you're there. Okay. Uh, I blinked out, but, and then once the, you know, once the tape was out, you know, and people, you know, knew how to, how to stay away from that, then there wasn't a lot. And, you know, that's, that's, that was a tough pill to swallow mm-hmm. as a world champion. You know, <laughs> well, so when I when I was coming up the ranks, there was a guy um, named Ryan Hall, who so I was a, I was always like a belt or two ahead of Ryan, but he was killing everybody. And they called him Dr. Ryangle. He was with Lloyd Irvin at the time. And he would just triangle everybody. I mean, he would go to all these events and just triangle, 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 triangle. He, and, you know, so can't remember what year it was that I went to DC. It was after he left Lloyd, but I went and trained at his gym and I basically interviewed him because he's just somebody that I wanted to ask all these sorts of questions to. And one of the questions was, I was just like, do you regret that you spent all of that time getting good at triangle and at the, at the cost, obviously at the cost of other being a well-rounded, you were a jack of one trade and, a master of none of the others, so to speak. Now, mind you, I was saying this to somebody who was then and at that point and now even an accomplished black belt, a well-rounded grappler. Yeah, not a chump. <laughs> Man, just ate my lunch and, and hit me with the lunch box afterward. <laughs> when I rolled with um, uh, uh, and, and he and he said he had an interesting answer to it. And the answer was, he goes, well, you, you need to become a master of everything eventually. So why not become a master of something really effective early on? Um, but then he also said that like in the, in the background, he was training jujitsu. He was training everything else. And, you know, it's just like with Keenan, uh, you know, having, having worked with Keenan and, and trained with him, you know, he's not just, only working worm guard or only working right. know, De La, De La, the De La Hivas that he was working and he's got, they're working their game. You know, it's not just like, um, um, you know, the Danaher death squad, you know, they're not just working their heel hooks. You know, they're, they're going to another tournament where they don't use heel hooks at all. And all of a sudden they're all on top, you know, I mean, you, you you got to master the st- you need to be purposeful and you got to master jujitsu so begin mastering it um you know it um but yeah I, emily is an amazing jujitsu practitioner and uh, a wealth of knowledge she's somebody who i've admired for a couple almost two decades now yeah um, i put her in that 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 sort of genius category that can take extraordinarily complex things and then say them in a way where, you know, kind of a dope like me goes, well, why didn't I get that? Right. You know, because it just suddenly it becomes simple. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, 
for that that talk with her was one that I left thinking, man, Harrison, how'd you get so dumb? <laughs> <laughs> She's really smart. Uh, I think she trained at uh, Marcelo's Academy for a long time. She did. Uh, she left, uh, I believe it was Ricardo Almeida uh, and, and trained with uh, Marcelo. Th- this was after the first world championship. And there right. were some cultural issues at that academy uh, that she didn't agree with. And then obviously uh, her, her career at, at Marcelo's has been really, really good. Yeah. And is she in Boston now? I think she's in New Jersey. New Jersey. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think it's Princeton, New Jersey. Really close to not New York City, so. Right. Yeah, I, I believe it's Princeton, New Jersey, but don't quote me on that. Uh, I should remember it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely, definitely somebody that uh, had extreme insight and and like yourself, you know, I, you've you've left me with a lot of things to to think about, things that I was maybe on the cusp of of you know putting together. Uh, but made more cogent or, you know, crystallized in a way that, that I can take and, and, and quite frankly, also be able to hand off, um, you know, because, and that's part of the excitement about the podcast is I, I, I'm really trying to put effort into giving this thing traction, uh, not from a personal aggrandizement or like, you know, I'm trying to, to create something big, but because I'm, I'm excited to create a platform uh, where, uh, these ideas, you know, have a chance to, to grow, you know, they, they, they have a chance to, to really, um, uh, spread to, to people who can put them to use because there's a lot of old rollers out there. You know, I'm not, I'm not the only guy who just turned 40 and wants to be tough. You know, I'm not the only guy who's 50 and wants to be tough or 60 or 72. Um, you know, like I, there's, there's, there's a lot of us and, and, you know, the ladies too. Uh, you know, just like Emily. And so I, I think that there's, it, I, I, it, there's not a market in terms of what I'm saying is like a way to make money. There's a market for these ideas because there are people who need to hear them and put them to work. You know, they, they, these can help. Yeah. I, I think you're, I think you're on to something. I think you're right. The, The study of jujitsu is not only a study of technique. It's not only a engaging of the combat. It's also an analysis of the martial art uh, of the, um, the mindset, the pedagogy, you know, and so to have, to have people weigh in on, Hey, what, what was it that got you here? What was it that got you to a success as a professor or a success as an athlete? I think people need to hear more and more and more of that um, because, uh, you know, there's, t- take it like this for an example. Um, if somebody's grandfather was a medical doctor and their dad was a medical doctor, go into med school or going to college, going to med school, and then passing the medical boards is probably not that frightening for the grandchild because everybody in my family's done it. You know, I, it's normalized, you know, it's, um, you know, if your great grandpa was an attorney and your grandpa was an attorney and your dad's an attorney, going to law school isn't going to be a scary thing. I, my parents weren't attorneys. So, you know, going to law school was like this sort of, oh my gosh, scary thing. You know, I don't know what it's going to be like. I've read the books. I know it's going to be hard and that weeds people out, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't normalized for me. Um, if um, in jujitsu, there's, you're just now starting to get a generation of American instructors that are kind of at the grandpa stage, you know, I mean, you got your, you got your dirty dozen guys, your Chris Howders, your, your Roy Harris. Um, you, you've got your second generation, which I, I kind of view myself as right on that second generation of American instructors. Um, even though my, my instructors were Brazilian coming up, 
so I could be seen as a first generation American jiu-jitsu instructor. There's still a generation of Americans before me that can sort of feed into this sort of this, this narrative. But guys like you that are putting out these podcasts that are asking people, hey, what, what got you to be a professor or what got you to be a third degree or second degree black belt? you know, um, and what advice do you have to get normalizes this. And that's what I want to do is I want to normalize the process for my students. I always tell my students, it should take you less time to get your black belt than it took me because I should be sanding the board down. You should run into fewer splinters of stupidity because I, I sand those away faster. Mm -hmm. We're going to, we're going we're gonna to become more efficient hasn't necessarily been true because there's deficiencies in my instruction as well. But, you know, the, the goal, my goal for certain is that it shouldn't take 13 years for somebody who starts jujitsu with me to get their black belt. You know, my, my systems are better than my instructor systems. Previous instructors systems were, I'm always trying to be better with my delivery, my packaging, my process, my analysis, my critical feedback, you know, all of these different things. But the other part of it is the normalizing of it. You know, once there's, you know, in Brazil, it's not that big of a deal to get your black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu because when you walk into a gym, there's 19 black belts. You know, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to teach in Brazil. Uh, I went down on a mission trip and was invited to teach jiu-jitsu at one of the academies there. You know, and here I am a gringo who speaks very poor Portuguese and I walk in and there's seven, eight black belts. And these, these blue belts that are in there, they don't realize how good they got it, you know, but we're getting to that stage where, you know, in a decade, a lot of jujitsu gyms, and a lot of normal jujitsu gyms in middle United States are going to have three or four black belts. It's not going to be this enigma you know you know where ooh, tim's a black belt oh he's a black belt wow he must have he must have that special gene <laughs> no the special genes i got there's three of them it's persist persevere and have perspective you know those are the genes but maybe not a lot on the perspective but <laughs> true true put my nose to the grindstone at all costs well I, I leave this conversation, uh, I think, better than I entered it uh, because you've given me, like I said, you've helped me clean up some of the things that I was trying to make sense of, you know, and, and put together about efficiency of training and economy of training and uh, especially the four methods of, of training and, you know, how to prioritize, you know, how to use each one. I think in a way I mentally, I was saying like, maybe rolling isn't that important. Maybe I need to just be situational sparring, but just like what you said, it, man, it, you got to have something that's like the payoff because otherwise you start to lose the love. And while I was nowhere near that point yet, I, I honestly probably could see that happening. If, if it was just like spent all day, you know, eating that turd sandwich, you know, and so I can't thank you enough for your time and your insight uh, and, and being willing to, to talk to us. And, you know, the other thing is, is that a lot like to talk with Emily, actually, I, I, I leave this conversation energized to, to work harder to, to build this, this community uh, because I think that there's a lot of people that can attain value from conversations like this one, you know? And so while I'm not sure that I'm qualified to take on the responsibility of, you know, that proliferation, you know, I, I, I do feel that jujitsu has given me a lot. And so I, I, I owe it to try and give it, you know, something back. Uh, so once again, I, I can't thank you enough for, for being willing to spend the time with me. It's a Saturday night. There's a lot of things you could be doing, uh, but you're talking jujitsu with some bald hillbilly. Uh, 
Um, and so that's, that's, you know, something that I don't take for granted. Um, if I definitely want, when you, uh, put your, your website up in the essay specifically, like the, the four modes of training, uh, you know, get that, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with it and I'll, I'll, um, uh, be sure to share that with, uh, the old rollers as much as I can. Uh, cause I think that's, that's a valuable, once again, cogent way of putting it that, you know, gives, gives a way of, of breaking down, you know, how to, what is the training split? Cause that's been a big question on this show is like, what's an ideal training split. And, uh, we've talked with people like Lachlan Giles who, you know, they, he, he's, he gave like a graduate level course on periodization for the, uh, the grappling athlete. And, uh, you know, had, had some very you know, like high level and innovative ideas about how to, how to, how to learn and, mm -hmm. um, and, and preserve the body while learning and performing at, you know, a world-class level. Um, because he's a physical therapist as well as, you know, a, a world-class contender. So it's, it's, you know, I, we've already learned a lot, you know, and, and that, that idea of what is the ideal split, well, it turns out it's kind of different for everybody. Uh, but helping my fellow old rollers to, you know, take charge, get in the driver's seat and, and be purposeful in their choice of what their training split should look like is something that I'm excited to, to help do and, and, your ideas, I think, can, can help us with that. So for some of my folks who hadn't heard of you, uh, like I hadn't until Gary Hull, Hull told me about you, uh, how does somebody learn more about Tim Sled? Well, so, I mean, Facebook's probably the easiest way. Um, before, before I talk a little bit more about that, I just want one of the essays that I'm really proud of that I can't wait to get back up is called The Mental Revelations of a Progressing Grappler. Um, you can look that up on Google because it got cut and pasted to other people's websites over time. Um, I, I published it in 2009. Um, but it's, it's a great article for people who are white, blue, purple belts, brown belts, who are, who are just trying to figure out where am I at in this whole jujitsu journey. I wrote it uh, late in my brown belt career. I revisited it right after I got my black belt and I did a part two which has to do with scrambles. Um, but uh, so I, I, I'm going to have a website. Um, it's, uh, you know, part of it's my life is so busy that uh, and the priority of getting my website with my essays up um, hasn't been huge, but also it's, it's me trying to balance things, but I'll have my website up hopefully by the end of summer. Okay. Um, and I, I'll let you know, that's how, that's the best way to, to learn about me. Uh, Facebook is probably the easiest way for people to connect with me. If they want to ask me questions, check me out on, on Facebook or hit me up on messenger there and I'll get to you as soon as I can. Um, the, um, but I think the, the big, if you, if people just kind of want to know about me, that they, they can ask me directly or, or seek out somebody who I've trained with or, or anything like that. I, um, I'm an open book, so, uh, I'm on Instagram as well, but, um, I, like I said, I'm, 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 I view my, my purpose in life, uh, isn't just jujitsu. Um, you know, my purpose in life is to, uh, to glorify God. So if a lot of people watch me on Instagram and end up unfriending me on Instagram because I talk mm -hmm. about Jesus, but <laughs> that's, that's me. Well, uh, you know, it, it's, I think that what we find that gives us conviction, uh, no matter what that is, uh, is important. The, the spiritual element, uh, or personality element, the thing that makes us whole and gives us purpose mm -hmm. in life is, is a, a necessary thing. So for you, it's faith. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a non-religious person, mm -hmm. but I don't find myself the least bit bothered by listening to someone talk about their faith sure. because I, I hear them talking about the thing that is their, their essence. That's, you know, what they're trying to find of the truth of, of the universe. So mm -hmm. 
you know, how, how could you have a problem with that? You know, like uh, the, the only time that it, it becomes troubling is if someone has a problem with another person for having a difference in it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, all those things said, uh, we're definitely in a fractious time in our country, uh, maybe in the world, I don't know. Uh, but I think we all could use just a little bit of like, hey, you know, somebody's got a different idea than I do, but they're they're trying to grow and be a good person, and that's that's a good motivation. That's a good thing to be. Yeah, I think, and and one of the things that I I really appreciate about jujitsu, um, above sort of a lot of other activities that I've engaged in in life is dealing with sort of the fractures that we're in, in our, in our society um, is we all are naked underneath our gi, you know? So the, the mat is a sacred space, you know, black, white, brown, Asian, you know, whatever creed you come from, purple hair, bald head, you know, it comes down to technique and I, you know, whether you're a felon or a cop, you yeah. know, I don't know how many situations I've run into where you got, you got, you, you got somebody that's done hard time and then you've got the chief of police training and they, and they're rolling together. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's. And helping each other, and not, help. not, not just rolling, but you know, right. if the, the chief catches the felon with something, he's like, Hey, this is what you did wrong, you know, mm -hmm. or the other way around. Right. You know? There's, there's a, there's a beauty in that for sure. I, I and that can't be dismissed. It, it cannot. And, and that's, and I, I have found more commonality, more um, softening of the, of the armor of people who have stereotypes or racisms or reverse racisms after they've devoted themselves to a training community, because I mean, you, you have to have a certain amount of humor about yourself in jujitsu. I mean, in wrestling, I mean, you just, you're going to get beat. You're going to, you're going to get beat by people you think you shouldn't get beat by. You're going to, you know, um, that's the worst. Yeah. It's not the getting beat. It's getting beat by the guy that I don't like. <laughs> right. Hey, and, and you're going to, you're going to break wind on the mat. I mean, it, it happens. And, <laughs> and, and so there's, it's a really, jujitsu is really important. And I think jujitsu has a lot of healing power for um, communities and our society um, because it really is a point where a place where we're not measuring people by their skin color or their socioeconomic status. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, a gi costs about a hundred bucks, a belt costs about 20 bucks. And, you know, uh, people start, to, they doll themselves up with rash, rash guards and patches, but in the end of it, it doesn't make their arm lock any tighter. It doesn't make their guillotine any better. It doesn't make their guard pass any slicker. What does is how willing are they to hit the three P's that we've talked about over and over and over again and, and, and better themselves. And, you know, the rising tide raises all ships if you're in the gym and somebody is sucking it up, fix their technique. If you're tapping somebody with the same move over and over and over again, teach them how to stop it because the, it's going to make you a better grappler. It's going to make your teammates better grapplers. The rising tide raises all ships, bring them all up. And that's the truth with society as well. And, and not to get political or anything like that, <laughs> but, you know, you know, we have to look out for one another and we have to take care of one another and we have to, you know, ensure that, you know, we are the rising tide that is raising all ships. Otherwise we're a sink. We're, we're all going to sink. So anyway. Well, I, I agree with you. That's been a, a recurring theme, you know, rising tide lifts all ships has been a recurring theme in this podcast from all the great instructors and, and coaches and, and uh, practitioners. Uh, every single one of them was invested in by someone else and has invested in someone else. And that helped them. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to close out, 
because uh, we've been at this for a while and I don't want to keep you up all night. Uh, those of you who have made it this far, uh, clearly you care about training culture, training efficiency, training effectiveness, about getting good uh, as fast as possible, and about uh, longevity. We didn't talk too much about longevity. I'd like to bring you back on to, to discuss some of that. If you've been wrestling, you know, coming up and then uh, doing jujitsu since 98, I'm sure you've got some lessons on the mat of how to keep yourself on the mat. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, do us a favor here. Give me a like. Give me a share. Give me a subscribe. It really does make a difference. And secondly, Tim uh, was, was someone who uh, was introduced to me by a, a former uh, guest on the show, Gary Hull. Mm -hmm. But we've had guests on the show who were uh, brought to our attention from some of our listeners. There's somebody out there that, you know, fits this show that, you know, really thinks uh, in a way that, that has given you a lot of insight and made you better chances are that the rest of our uh, old roller nation is going to want to hear from him too. So shoot me a message. Let me know who it is and I'll reach out to him. I want to bring him on. I want to hear from him. I want to learn from him. Uh, Tim listened to the, the Tom Corey episode. So he wants to hear from him too. That's right. Uh, so um, like I said, do me a favor and help, help me out. Help me grow this community because the, the bigger the community is the, the more chance at outreach and the more people that I can get to talk to me. And the more people that I talk to me, the more we get to hear these extremely insightful ideas and put them to work in our training and get better and stay better. Uh, and with that, uh, I've got nothing else unless you've got anything you want to sign off with. Hey, just thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on. It's been a pleasure. Um, and uh, I, I, I wish this podcast just immense success in the future. And <laughs> no, I mean, I think that, I think that, if if nothing else, it's, it's a, it is a success because you get to have conversations with people who you wouldn't have normally had a conversation with, and everybody else who gets to eavesdrop in on it is all the better for it, you know. And um, um, having That's been having, I've, I mean, there used to be a, a a podcast called the Fight Works podcast. I listened to it all the time. I was on it. Their Inside BJJ podcast was one that I. Yeah listened to all the time. I was on Love it. That one. I was on it multiple times, you know, the BGG brick podcast, all of these Love podcasts, like they all start off with people saying, eh, you know, I don't know why we're, I'm doing this podcast necessarily, but maybe it's because I want to interview top grapplers or, or maybe it's because I want to hear and learn from top people, you know, but the, here's the thing, Tim Sled in central Indiana was interested in a lot of episodes and got to hear it. So other people will be as well. And podcasts are like the thing now, back when the fight works podcast came out, nobody was, I mean, it was weird. It was rare. It was <laughs> basically you had to be an Apple geek to, to get a podcast, but now podcasts are a thing. And, um, you know, and it, it'll be, it'll be an art, uh, that you'll hone in how to, you know, how to edit and, and, and title it and do all of that sort of stuff. So that you, grabs hits, but the long and the short of it is, you know, you're everything you've, all the questions you asked were fantastic. And I think are, are, are really good for viewers to hear and, um, and, um, uh, yeah, keep up the good work. Well, uh, I appreciate that. I, I won't, uh, let you talk uh, too much about me because the, the show's never about me. It's always about the guest. Uh, but I, that's very kind of you to say, uh, let me uh, pause the recording here.